just a matter of time before other companies really begin doing the micro strategy playbook. Gold is a $20 trillion asset. Bitcoin is currently about a $1 trillion asset. You have a very easy case to make that Bitcoin is at least digital gold. It's probably a lot better than digital gold. It's more scarce than gold. It's more divisible than gold. It's more portable than gold, arguably more fungible than gold. It's more verifiable than gold. What MicroStrategy has actually outperformed every company in the S&P 500. And it wasn't just luck. Like this is actually a, a strategy that anyone can employ and it works. Part of the reason why I think a lot of these bigger companies haven't done that is because these bigger companies aren't exactly like MicroStrategy. Like MicroStrategy was a very unique example. And so I think other companies are going to come. Michael Dell is one of the closest people to understanding Bitcoin. If humanity stores wealth in beachfront property, we will create more beachfront property. If humanity stores a lot of wealth in gold, we will create more gold and mine more gold and sell that gold in the market. Bitcoin is the only monetary and financial asset that no matter how much wealth we store in Bitcoin, we're not actually going to be able to create more than 21 million Bitcoin. The best way to save for the future in a very long-term risk-adjusted manner would be just buying Bitcoin, putting it in cold storage, and never touching it. If you want to outperform Bitcoin, you need something that's going to appreciate or generate returns in excess of 50% per year. And it needs to do so in like a risk-adjusted manner. Obviously, any investment that you're making that's going to give you 50% that's not Bitcoin on a long time horizon, there's going to be a lot of risk to that. If you hold your Bitcoin on an exchange or an ETF or a single hardware wallet, those are all single points of failure. You put out a video about how Dell could be a, a huge company. I think you even said like the largest company when they adopt a the micro strategy strategy. Uh, and you also cover uh, micro strategy uh, in, in some videos before. Um, is that, do you think that that's actually could happen that like uh, bigger companies, bigger than micro strategy is, are copying uh, this, this playbook and actually getting to have a major advantage uh, and what did you find out with, with that and, and uh, why that specific example? Yeah, I definitely think it can happen. Um, and to, to some extent, I would say it's probably just a matter of, of time before other companies really begin doing the micro strategy playbook, right? Like we have the, the smaller examples like Selmer Scientific, um, Meta Planet, and maybe a, a few other private small companies that are effectively doing the exact same thing as, as MicroStrategy, like Cathedra, Bitcoin announced that they're trying to accumulate more Bitcoin per share. Like that's kind of their objective when running the, 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 the company. Dell, I think is an interesting example. And it would obviously be if they went on a, a full Bitcoin standard, like MicroStrategy has, it would be the, the largest company to do so. Like you've had, for example, you've had Tesla buy Bitcoin, you've had Square buy Bitcoin, you've had, I think Coinbase probably even owns a little bit of Bitcoin, or I hope they do. Um, but none of those larger companies have like fully embraced a Bitcoin standard and focused exclusively on accumulating more Bitcoin per share for their shareholders. Um, and, and part of the reason why I think a lot of these bigger companies haven't done that is because these bigger companies aren't exactly like MicroStrategy. Like MicroStrategy was a very unique example where Saylor was the, the founder, he was the CEO, and now he's the chairman. And he had, I believe, like a majority of the voting rights or, or something that enabled him to basically move MicroStrategy in a very unique direction that other companies like have to go through a bunch of executives and then they have to get their board of directors on board. And there's a lot of different stakeholders that need to buy into this pretty, you know, crazy, but new idea of, of, of Bitcoin and, and accumulating more Bitcoin per share. And so like he was able to, to do that just because he was the, you know, the buck stopped with him. Like he was the final deci decision maker. Whereas Dell is, I haven't, you know, gone too deep into like how their corporation is structured. Now their executives are structured and who has all the voting rights for the shares, but I would imagine it's a little bit more, dispersed uh, than MicroStrategy, which might be part of the reason why it's taking so long, even if Michael Dell has been cryptically tweeting about Bitcoin here and there. But I do think it's possible. Um, and I think it, it should happen. It's, it's, it's probably just a matter of a time before, you know, people actually do buy into the, the thesis that Sailor is executing a, a good strategy and they see the, the past results and, and, and they 
understand that like, hey, MicroStrategy has actually outperformed every company in the S&P 500. Um, and it wasn't just luck. Like this is actually a, a, a skill or not a skill, but a, a strategy that anyone can employ and it works. And so I think other companies are going to come but I don't know if Dell is is for sure going to be the next one. I made the video because I hope they are. And I think Michael Dell is one of the closest people to understanding Bitcoin. But uh, I don't know timing or, or if they will actually be the next domino to fall. It's also interesting the time that we're in because if you just track the past uh, um, uh, price movements, we are right before... Uh, a possible major bull run. I mean, we kind of had already a major bull run in the last 12 months. We are up uh, significantly, um, but uh, everyone is like uh, feeling not that big of a bull run that could have happened. Uh, so like the, the October uh, movement now and, and the next 12 months could be tried traumatic would be interesting how also this would then pressure maybe or uh, get some form into these companies where like, okay, may maybe uh, the one or two decision makers that are on the verge, maybe they find a quicker decision now, or they have some more time pressure in the board meetings that they have. And all of a sudden uh, things move quicker when maybe this, the Bitcoin price moves sideways, the arguments are not there. Is, is that this, is that formal level that we see in retail maybe also a factor in, in, in big companies and corporations, or is, is that uh, not the reality? Yeah. I mean, I would imagine that like key executives of large corporations would probably try to argue that like they're making very strategic calculated decisions. But I think at the end of the day, they are just individual people that are subject to the exact same emotions and fears as a normal retail investor. And I think Bitcoin is so massively misunderstood by so many different people that the way almost virtually everyone at least initially learns about Bitcoin is via the number going up, number go up technology, the price is going up. And when the price is going up, that either forces them to like question their original assumptions because like maybe they'd heard about Bitcoin years ago, completely wrote it off like virtually everyone originally does. And then they're like, wait a second, like I thought this died five years ago or three years ago or two years ago. It's still alive and it's it's now at an all time high. Like what is going on here? And so it kind of forces you and everybody to question your original assumptions. And then you're like, OK, like this thing, it, you know, you do some research and you're like, wait a second, like maybe I don't even really know what money is to begin with. Maybe like maybe Bitcoin is happens to be the best form of money or, or a new form of money. And so it's like the number go up is kind of the Bitcoin's best marketing material, I would say, or marketing strategy. And yeah, I think w when the bull run takes off, it, it, you know, I don't know when, but I would I would expect soon as well. Um, I think a lot of people will start questioning their original assumptions and wondering why they don't have a, a larger allocation or why they're not maybe doing the, the micro strategy strategy of, you know, putting a, a almost entire all of your balance sheet into Bitcoin as it's the best way to preserve and grow capital into the future on a long-term risk adjusted basis. So yeah, I, I think people will uh, definitely fall for the uh, number go up uh, technology. One thing that's kind of interesting thinking back to Sailor is like he uh, kind of joined or became a, a Bitcoiner, I guess, um, back in August of 2020, I believe it was the specific month, which was like right after the halving, we weren't really in a major bull run. It's 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 somewhat similar to where we are right now. So it would be really awesome if there was like another sailor that popped up pretty soon um, at like a large publicly traded company. And maybe there will be, I don't know. But um, it is kind of interesting how sailor timed it very well, like in, 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 in retrospect, right? Like he didn't time the, the bear market bottom in like 2018 or 2019 perfectly by any means. But like he he got in right before the 2020 slash 2021 bull run. And I think that was like, you know, critical probably for, for some of his success and being able to weather Bitcoin's extreme volatility. Because like a lot of people pretty much buy in near the top and they have to watch their portfolio draw down 80%. And if you pulled the sailor strategy, you know, at the 2017 top or the 2021 top, and that was when you were like, I'm 100% all in on Bitcoin and you then you watch your entire portfolio fall 80%. That would be a pretty brutal and especially if you used leverage like Sailor does at, at, you know to a small extent, then you could get wiped out. And so like Sailor timed the market uh 
pretty perfectly, probably by just chance. Um, but it is kind of interesting to to think about like his timing and then what might be the timing of of you know the next major corporation. Yeah, it's interesting the the era of 2020, the 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 COVID 2020 era, because I think a lot of people all of a sudden came to uh, uh, stop to uh, like a lot of activities that they were doing all of a sudden were not possible anymore, like going out uh, with friends. All of a sudden, everything was cancelled. Uh, maybe your work even stopped. Uh, I imagine I, I was in a situation where I basically worked like 70 hours and then all of a sudden had zero hours for, for two weeks, uh, which was amazing for me uh, as it, it was really cool and gave me time to think and was also the starting point of, of social media for me. And I think that's what also a lot of people had um, in 2020 where they all of a sudden had like, oh, what's going on and we have time and, and and things that we previous thought are correct all of a sudden not correct anymore and uh i think 2020 era was the one one og that came out of that was was probably michael sailor the the biggest one from that uh and it would be interesting uh which one would be the biggest one coming out of like the 2024 having bitcoin etf uh kind of a time because it's also like the last just 12 months, a lot of things happened in Bitcoin. Uh, so I um, imagine like it, could, it would be an, uh, really interesting if there is another Michael with Michael Dell uh, coming out of, of, of that era. Really, really cool. Yeah. Interesting thought also. Um, to your report that you said uh, with, uh, that you also have in your Twitter bio also saying your wealth is melting by Bitcoin. Um, I'm not aware of, of, of the reports. So like, let's go with like, what did you write in there and, and what can we, we learn from that? And what's, what's kind of the, the assumptions from? Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely go, go over, uh, your wealth is melting. So this was a report I published earlier this year and it was exp inspired by, you know, a number of, of great Bitcoin writers and, and thinkers and even, you know, prior like Austrian economists and, and, and whatnot. Um, the way I, I, I've always thought about Bitcoin is kind of uh, maybe a unique way. Like I've, I've loved Jeff Booth, his thesis of like hyper technology deflation effectively, like showing that humanity is becoming hyper, hyper productive um, currently and over the last hundred plus years, like we learned to fly. And then like 60 years later, we landed on the moon and we've, you know, we're storing data on like, you know, one megabyte massive hard drives many, many years ago. And now we can go on amazon.com and buy a three terabyte hard drive for like a couple hundred bucks. And so it's like, we are becoming incredibly, incredibly efficient. And I think a lot of people intuitively know this and they, and they kind of feel it, but then in consumer prices, like in dollars or euros or whatever currency you're, you're using, you still see the price of food going up. You see the price of X going up, Y going up, whatever, all of these basic consumer goods, your rents going up. You know that like humanity with computers and technology and, and all of these mass efficiencies were becoming more productive, but at the same time, everything is getting more expensive, which is just like kind of, uh, doesn't feel right per se. And, and Jeff Booth obviously talks about this idea of like, well, naturally what's happening is we're, we actually are becoming more productive at this stuff and technology deflation does exist and it should be making things and consumer items cheaper. And the, the concept of the, and your wealth is melting is not just applying this to basic consumer goods, but it applies this concept of technology deflation to all financial assets that humans hold today. Right. And so like, if you have a, large, large portion of your wealth in gold. Well, not only does technology deflation apply to building hard drives, but it actually applies to gold production as well, where over the last 200 plus years, think about how much more efficient and more productive we are at mining gold out of the ground. Like we're not going in rivers and like panning for, for gold per se. We're, we're using heavy duty machines that are like digging massive holes into the ground and using a lot of energy, maybe not even that many people. Um, and we're extracting more and more gold per year. And if you like, if you go back and you assume that the supply of gold is growing at 2% per year, every year, ever since like, you know, thousands of years ago, then we're actually producing more gold this year than all of the gold produced from like 2000 BC to like 1860 AD. 
Um, and that's just because of, even though it's, it's 2% and in, in the supply growth, it's still 2% that compounds every year. And you can even see like historical estimates of, of gold supply growth charts. It's, it looks parabolic if you zoom out on a long enough time horizon, because we're getting more and more productive at, at, you know, mining gold. And so the, this whole concept of your wealth is melting is this idea that like, Hey, if humanity is storing $20 trillion worth of wealth in this yellow rock called gold, well, that's a $20 trillion bounty on uh, being able to mine more gold and sell it to the market at uh, you know the current market price. And that doesn't just apply to gold, that applies to real estate. If, if humanity is, is holding 300 or $200 trillion worth of wealth in real estate, well, that's a massive incentive to go out there and build more houses or build more apartment buildings or even create more land. Like Boston, the city of Boston is we've created more land in the city of Boston and Dubai. There's a, there's a, uh, a, an artificial Island off the coast of Dubai called Palm Jomera, which homes like thousands of thousands of residents that was created, you know, in the middle of the ocean. Um, so like, we are able to, if, if humanity stores wealth in beachfront property, we will create more beach, beachfront property. And we have, if humanity stores a lot of wealth in gold, we will create more gold and, 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 you know, mine more gold and, and sell that gold in the market and, and extract value from people that hold wealth in gold. Bitcoin is the only monetary and financial asset that no matter how much wealth we store in Bitcoin, we're not actually going to be able to create more than 21 million Bitcoin, no matter how much time energy resources or how much more productive humanity gets that is going to be a fixed supply that can never be increased um, forever and so that's completely different from every other financial asset and i think part of you know a problem that we've had is like we've become so productive over the last 200 plus years we have no idea where to actually store this wealth like we're storing it in gold we're storing it in real estate we're storing it in, in large cap us equity markets we don't know. And so we create this like massive diversified portfolio of everything because we have no idea like where to actually put all this wealth that we've generated with technology and 8 billion people being connected, you know, with a phone or with a computer like this. And so this, this idea of all of this wealth that we store outside of Bitcoin is slowly melting away. Even if it's at a very slow, so slow rate, it's still melting as we pr can produce more of this stuff. Bitcoin is this one monetary tool that we can't create more of. And it's very different from everything else. Is, is gold uh, the main competitor of, of, of Bitcoin? Is like a gold uh, the, the thing that we, we kind of have to beat in, in terms of narrative of store of value? I think it's one of the first ones, but I, I, <clears throat> I think it's, it, it really applies to um, any, any financial asset that humans are, are actively storing wealth in. It can be gold, it can be real estate, it can be bonds, it can be equities, it can be stocks, right? Like if the world holds uh, $3 trillion worth of wealth in NVIDIA, that's a massive bounty on being able to design and manufacture GPUs in a more efficient manner or build a better GPU or build AI so or build software that maybe makes one GPU like a thousand times more efficient. And so it's like all any, it's, it's all like one big pool in my mind of like wealth and if you store wealth in certain things and people that's going to, you know, incentivize people to produce more of those things. And Bitcoin is just this one thing that, that we can't produce more of. And so, yeah, I think gold's like obviously one of the, the, the main ones, but I still think like in the grand scheme of the entire global financial system, Bitcoin and gold are still very, very small. So probably like in the short to medium term, which might be like the next 10 plus years, um, they're both probably going to do very well, especially in in dollar terms. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely think so too. Uh, it would be interesting also to, to to see. I think one of the huge markets wasn't the real estate market the the biggest one. I think Jesse Meyer Myers put some some interesting uh, chart out that is also Michael Saylor using a lot. Uh, I think real estate was the biggest one from there, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, I don't know if it's in, also in America, so but in Austria, people actually use real estate as a personal savings account, which is uh, pretty hilarious because for me, real estate is is either a home or a business, uh, depending on how you look at it. But it it's never savings. It should should not be a, a, a savings device. It's just like like if you buy 
uh, a camera or if you buy a computer, it's also not a savings device uh, and so should not be a home. Why, why do you think is, is real estate right now and, and still such a huge market and so um, uh, such a, an interesting um, uh, asset where people store the wealth in? And how do you envision that changing over, over time towards Bitcoin, maybe also with like Bitcoin being maybe collateral in, in the future where we borrow against our, our Bitcoin? Is, is that something that you're looking at? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, I guess two things on why real estate. One is real estate is a a, a semi scarce asset. Like kind of looking at the entire landscape of financial assets, real estate is it's it's a, it's more scarce than food. It's more scarce than water bottles. It's more scarce than like basic consumer goods, cars, whatever. Um, and so that makes it somewhat good at storing value. It's obviously more scarce than dollars. Like if you think about what even is a dollar or traditional fiat currency dollar specifically it's a unit of account that's tied to a basket of consumer goods right and these consumer goods were being able to produce more and more per year and the dollar is designed to lose two percent every year at least against this basket of consumer goods and so if we're able to produce more and more of this basket of consumer goods in a more productive manner then you know the dollar is going to lose value against that and obviously houses and actual land and real estate are a lot more scarce than these basic consumer goods, which the dollar is designed to lose value against. And so obviously real estate is going to gain value against the dollar over time because it's harder to build a house and, and a new piece of land than it is to manufacture a water bottle and ship it to you know another city. And so real estate is semi-scarce. It's more scarce than the dollar. And so obviously people are going to, you know, use real estate as a store of value it, unless there's something better, which I obviously I think is Bitcoin, but just no one really recognizes that. And two, the second reason why I think a lot of people store wealth in real estate is because you can access very cheap leverage with real estate, right? Like a lot of people don't think about it this way, but when you, at least in the United States, when you buy a house, typically what you'll do is take out a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, which enables you to put 20% down or 10% down and effectively, that enables you to go 5x or 10x long U.S. real estate. And obviously, like I mentioned, real estate is a lot more scarce than basic consumer goods. The dollar is designed to lose value against basic consumer goods. And so obviously, the dollar is going to lose value against something that's more scarce than basic consumer goods, which is real estate. And so if real estate is going to go up against the dollar, then you want to actually go leverage long real estate to, to some extent because you can generate a lot of wealth that way. Um, and that's what people do, right? Like, so you can buy a bunch of real estate with money that's not yours. You can borrow the money at a fixed rate for 30 years. And you know that the dollar is going to lose a lot of value over the next 30 years. And you know that the interest rate can't increase, at least in the United States, if you bar borrow at a fixed rate mortgage. And then even if rates go down, then you can refinance your, your mortgage and borrow the money at a, at a lower interest rate and 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 then that enables you to save more money and 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 kind of get more leverage at a cheaper price. So the those are kind of like the two reasons why <clears throat> why people have have used real estate to to store value and I think it's 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 it would continue happening until there was a superior alternative um which obviously I think is bitcoin. I think you'll be able to save bitcoin uh in a superior long-term risk adjusted manner. You won't have to take out leverage against your bitcoin unless you really want to. Um, but I think that's kind of how it's going to continue playing out. I think Bitcoin is good collateral and it's going to be very interesting to see how like the Bitcoin collateralized loan market plays out. Um, like Unchain is a pioneer in that for commercial lending for businesses where you can deposit your Bitcoin as collateral, uh, buy, b borrow dollars, um, and then buy other assets or buy more Bitcoin potentially, you know, whatever the business would want to do. Um, but it's still a pretty small market um, in the grand scheme of like all lending uh, loan markets and, and the entire banking system. But I do think over time, it's probably a, a, a massive market that will eventually be tapped by, you know, Unchained and banks and a bunch of other entities. Yeah, it seems like a, a no brainer. If, if you have get the Bitcoin, you borrow against it, get US dollars uh, and take the long-term approach. There's like this amazing chart that I'm obsessed with <laughs> this week. 
uh, where you see the Bitcoin price, but in a four year moving average. So like the Bitcoin price is basically just like a straight line up. It does like some waves to it, but it, it looks like a, uh, a hill upwards and not those crazy uh, volatility in there. And if you look at that, then you're like, okay, yeah, like let's let's take some four, five, six year uh, borrowing time uh, against the, the Bitcoin, and then I can just like uh, refinance the, the 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 loan in in like five years. Then the US dollar definitely will have lost value, and my Bitcoin definitely have like with ninety nine percent. I certainly have uh, gained value, uh, and then you can easily repay that. So it's it's an interesting strategy, and, and I often I, probably because of Celsius and other uh, instances, uh, it's not bigger than it is now. I feel like the, this, this <laughs> scared a lot of people. <laughs> I yeah. made a bad rap about it, but we, we will probably get back to that. And uh, as as Bigger players also come in. I guess also normal big banks. Uh, I envision coming into the scene. Like th this will not only be a, a Bitcoin companies thing. I think really big banks uh, will. It will probably only be a time, uh, only a question of time till they come in. Do, do you also see it like that? The big banks, JP Morgan, maybe even <laughs> that would be funny. They come in and, and say like, "Yeah, borrow uh, your Bitcoin against it." Yeah, and. I, I, like Sailor has talked about uh, this a little bit recently too. I mean, I I, I think that's probably inevitable. Um, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out because you know we don't know exactly what services large banks would end up offering when it comes to to Bitcoin. Whether it's um, you know borrowing against your Bitcoin or, or or like yield on your Bitcoin and like what that would even mean. Obviously, a lot of people were highly burned by FTX block find Celsius. And I'm extremely, extremely skeptical, maybe perpetually forever skeptical of any sort of Bitcoin yield product, no matter who that would be coming from. Um, because at the end of the day, I feel like if you are taking uh, earning yield on your Bitcoin, you are taking risk. Um, it's not like the dollar system where when you deposit dollars into JP Morgan, um, they can't you know, put those dollars uh, into uh, into a T bill, which is basically the government, and they're never the government is never going to the U.S. government is never going to default. If they if they are on the cusp of default, they can literally print the money and give you your yield. Whereas, um, and so you don't really have to worry about that when it comes to depositing dollars. But with Bitcoin, is is a completely different story, right? Because if someone's lending out your Bitcoin, there's no lender of last resort for Bitcoin. Um, if if JP Morgan or Celsius or FTX lends out your Bitcoin to a counterparty and the counterparty loses the Bitcoin and JP Morgan becomes insolvent or FTX becomes insolvent, then obviously you're probably going to lose a big chunk of your Bitcoin, if not all of it. Um, so I think that, that it's, it's very uh, important to be highly skeptical of any sort of Bitcoin yield product forever, <laughs> probably. And, um, you know, We'll, we'll see how it ends up playing out over the next, you know, couple of decades. But yeah, I think Bitcoin as collateral will, will continue to be a, a massive uh, growing market or, or become a lot more massive in the future. I think like you can look at stocks uh, and like, uh, uh, you know, your typical brokerage account as a part of that. Like if you go to interactive brokers in the United States, you can borrow against your, your stocks at basically like, Fed funds or LIBOR plus like 50 basis points, which is basically like some of the cheapest interest rates that you can get on any th asset in the world. I think that eventually that same concept is probably going to come to Bitcoin. Obviously, whenever you borrow against Bitcoin, it's you know highly important, especially in this manner. It's highly important to do so in a very, very conservative way. Like in a perfect world, you know, it'd be cool to take out a 30 year 30 year fixed rate mortgage and buy Bitcoin because, you know, your house, they don't mark to market your house if it starts to fall in value. Whereas if you borrow against your Bitcoin, they are marked, to, you are marked to marketing like the value of your Bitcoin. So you might get a margin call, but obviously with a 30 year mortgage, as long as you keep making your payment, it doesn't matter if the house, the price of your house falls, you know, it, they're not going to be like post more collateral. Like it is what it is. Um, whereas when you borrow against Bitcoin, um, you know, they might be like, Hey, post more, post more Bitcoin as collateral because the price of Bitcoin just collapsed. So you have to be very conservative, but yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a growing market and in the long run, obviously if Bitcoin continues functioning, it's going to keep going up. 
Um, and it's probably going to be a pretty good trade for a number of people like it has been. Did you see the discussion between Mark Sale and Savrin Amus where they talked about a, a risk-free rate? I unfortunately just saw the, the clip. I didn't came to see the whole podcast, so I didn't didn't have the context. But did you see see that? And uh, how, how was that? <laughs> how is that coming that Mark Sale talks about risk-free yield? I remember him talking about uh, Celsius in a bad way in 2021, where he's like, Uh, why that? Why take the chances? Five percent more yield, and now it seems like he changed his opinion. But I did not see the whole thing. Yeah, I saw it too. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a it's a super. First, I think the the discussion that Safety and Sailor had is very good for the community. It's important to be uh, disagreeing on things and having uh, you know good arguments on on both sides. I I listened to it like once and then I, I tried to go back and listen to it again uh to to really understand i haven't fully um grasped exactly what sailor is saying like one if sailor is saying that you, jp you'll be able to deposit you know a hundred million dollars worth of bitcoin at jp morgan and someone is going to be willing to borrow that bitcoin or say say you deposit a hundred bitcoin at jp morgan And someone's willing to borrow 100 Bitcoin and they like literally take the Bitcoin off the platform, off JP Morgan and do something with the Bitcoin. And they bring back a year from now, 105 Bitcoin. And then they, JP Morgan pays you 104 Bitcoin. Um, like maybe that will exist, but I'm highly skeptical of like how big that market would be because I don't really know like who actually in today's world wants to borrow Bitcoin as long as the dollar still exists. Like, There's a few niche applications maybe for that. Like if you're a market maker and you have a, a unique uh, algorithm that enables you to basically generate a small, small yield off your Bitcoin by just like arbitraging exchanges or, or something along those lines, maybe, but I don't see like how big the market is for that. And then maybe like people want to borrow Bitcoin because they want to short Bitcoin, but I still also, I don't even think that market's really big either. And so I'm a little skeptical of like how big the borrowing Bitcoin market would be today. If Sailor's talking about like a, another way where it's like you deposit Bitcoin at JP Morgan and then JP Morgan like borrows against your Bitcoin, they keep your Bitcoin at JP Morgan and they like buy T bills with it and then they they earn 5% in dollar terms and then pay you some of that off your Bitcoin. Maybe he's talking about like that but i don't really know i i haven't fully grasped exactly what he's talking about and I, i hope that like other people start talking about this and and we can like learn you know how bitcoin and banking might actually work 10 years from now or 20 years from now because it is kind of interesting to to how to see how that will actually play out and and you know you know what what, what type of services would jp morgan actually be willing to offer um i think it's interesting Yeah, that, that's that's super interesting. Yeah, it's also the question of like, what financial services do we even need in like a hyper Bitcoinized world? Yeah, like, what, what, do do we need yield on our money if our money is appreciating? And uh, that that's the yield, like right? the, the appreciating of your money and the uh, increase in the purchasing power. That's kind of the yield. Yep, exactly, and and that's like why most like like the the future is basically self self custody or, or like collaborative custody because you actually like yes you can you know take riskier bets like you can invest in stocks you can lend out your bitcoin you can do a, a bitcoin bank whatever the heck that actually means to whoever's talking about that um but at the end of the day like if bitcoin is just good money and like parker lewis has written about like the great definancialization which is kind of what hyper bitcoinization could be then the best way to save for the future uh, in, a, in a very long-term risk-adjusted manner would be just buying Bitcoin, putting it in cold storage, and never touching it. Like That would be the best way to, to, to save for the future because natural technology deflation is going to make things cheaper. Like the, the yield that you'd be getting on your Bitcoin is just the free market lowering prices for you forever in perpetuity, and you never have to take any real risk. You don't actually get, you know, 1% on your Bitcoin. It's just like the price of the things that you're buying are actually just falling year after year and you just hold Bitcoin. But maybe there will, but like maybe people will try to come up with the next BlockFi and the next Celsius and maybe a wave of people will fall for that again. 
and maybe it's and not you know maybe it's JP Morgan that's claiming to do this and it's a little sketchy but at the end of the day it's probably like on a very long time horizon the best way to hold wealth for the future is to actually not trust any counterparty take possession of the bitcoin yourself and you know like unchain is one of the best ways to do that if you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis i guess you already bought some bitcoin and now the most important step is to keep the bitcoin keep them secure in a hardware wallet my personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the bitbox it's super secure it's simple to set up it's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the bitcoin on an exchange and you can get a five percent discount with the code robin at the checkout visit bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the Bitcoin Way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, I think I just had the thought in my mind, if JP Morgan actually has a, a, a nice looking product out there, which is like, oh yeah, like put your Bitcoin there and you get like a, a yield on on your Bitcoin for 5%. I think a lot of people will do that because they trust that name and trust that Federal Reserve system. Uh, and obviously hardcore Bitcoin is like, I would not do this. I mean, I'm not in America anyways, but uh, I w hardcore Bitcoiners would probably not do that, but a lot of other B Bitcoiners that are not that hardcore, maybe are just like a few percent in, they were like, yeah, let's, let's do it with JP Morgan. They are a safe bet. So <laughs> that would be, would be an interesting, uh, thing uh, if JP Morgan actually does something like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's confusing why Michael Saylor is talking about that because I remember before even Celsius collapsed, I remember seeing videos of him or interviews with him. Uh, where he was asked, okay, is, is, is Celsius something good? And he always answered with the same thing as like, why add any risk to your Bitcoin for like 5% more? And he always brought up, <laughs> up the example, like you, you make such huge gains with just having Bitcoin. Why have a little bit more profits for uh, an, uh, an enormous more amount of, of risk? And that, that seems to be exactly the same thing. Now it's just JP Morgan instead of Celsius. I mean, JP Morgan is probably more trust is way more trustworthy than Celsius <laughs> uh, because Celsius got bought. It's interesting. I just was uh, thinking about that. But yeah, uh, a couple. Uh, uh, one one other thought that I had. It's like it's also like I mean, it's interesting to think about the concept of outperforming Bitcoin in general because that's kind of what these entities are saying that they're able to do. Is like I'm able to take one Bitcoin and turn it into 1.05 Bitcoin. And I'm able to do it in a risk-free way. Um, and, and you can deposit your, you can withdraw your Bitcoin from us whenever you want to. So it's like a liquid uh, investment that supposedly outperforms Bitcoin. And I'm just highly, highly skeptical of that. And, but it's interesting to think about, right? Like looking back at the Celsius and the block I, I, I would look at it and be like, how would it be possible for you to deposit Bitcoin into BlockFi and earn 6% interest. Like 
even if like I obviously I knew it was you know not gonna work like this something was wrong with it but it was like internally like how are they how do they think that they're actually able to do this and like one of the one of the things that that uh that you know people had talked about was like the gbtc trade which was like a kind of an arbitrage opportunity that existed for a very long time and then it didn't exist and then that's part of the reason why blockfi went under where like gbtc would always trade at a premium and so basically people would send bitcoin to grayscale and then they would receive six months later gbtc shares and then they would sell the shares at a premium to to what they just deposited the Bitcoin in, and then they would earn like a, a Bitcoin yield. Of course, that works until GPTC starts trading at a discount, exactly like it did, you know, I think at the end of 2021, early 2022. And then all of a sudden, you know, that trade completely blew up. It was not a Bitcoin yield generator. It was like a, a Bitcoin loss generator. And people had a lot of Bitcoin stuck in that trade. And that's part of the reason like, why BlockFi went under. And then like Celsius, like you hear stories of, of Celsius is like, they were trying to generate Bitcoin yield by like buying miners and mining sites, which is like, you know, yes, it's possible to outperform Bitcoin that way. But to say it's like a almost a, a, a zero risk strategy to do that is just like completely wrong and completely irresponsible. So like even if JP Morgan one day says, hey, we're able to pay you 5% on your Bitcoin, I would be very curious to see like what their strategy is and like why it exists in the market. But I would be highly skeptical that it works unless it's like a very unique thing with the dollar system that you know I I can't fully comprehend right now. Um, but I would be highly skeptical of anyone that says they're able to give you risk free yield on your Bitcoin. I I, I see the the hardcore Bitcoiners sitting now and saying like oh yeah they 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 will give you a yield so they can custody your Bitcoin and then <laughs> get more Bitcoin on the on the banking sides. But this whole thing is uh, posing a really interesting question. What does happen to companies, the investment world, the venture capital world, and all that world when all of a sudden you have a hurdle rate of Bitcoin? Like it's it's easy for a uh, venture capitalist to invest in a bunch of startups and one might go up because he has to get rid of his money anyways. He has to get rid of his US dollars anyways because they will completely debase anyways. Every investor knows that. And they are just taking a bet on, on, on small startups. What does that do when uh, a successful investor doesn't have to invest in, in, in companies because his money is actually growing uh, over time and he can live a, a more comfortable life and a more st a stressless life with just staying in Bitcoin and doing uh, his own things. Like, what, what does that do? Yeah, this is probably like one of the most interesting questions I would say in economics right now. And probably almost no one is talking about it. The way I've thought about it is, is yes, what's going to happen is effectively the, the hurdle rate for a viable investment will go up massively and it already kind of has like if you're evaluating your investment decisions in bitcoin terms like i would say michael saylor is then you effectively come to the conclusion that you need to outperform bitcoin today not just in this theoretical post hyper bitcoinization world that we're also talking about um and so today it's like if you want to outperform bitcoin you you need to find something that's going to generate and and we can think in dollar terms just to make it simple for people. Like you need something that's going to appreciate or generate returns in excess of 50% per year. If you think over the next few years, Bitcoin's going to have a compound annual growth rate of 50% or so. And it needs to do so in like a risk adjusted manner. Obviously any investment that you're making, that's going to give you 50%. That's not Bitcoin um, on a long time horizon. There's going to be a lot of risk to that. It might be like, VC type investments. It might be like highly leveraged private equity type investments. It's going to be things that are actually pretty risky. And so it's like, yes, you, maybe you can find like something that would outperform 50% compound annual growth rate. Like you could bet on a sports game. And like, if you hit the right number, um, then uh, yeah, you could double your money overnight, but it's like on a risk adjusted basis, obviously the best bet is to hold Bitcoin and not to gamble your money on the, on sports. Um, and so that's kind of like the entire investment world will, will basically be like sports gambling versus just holding Bitcoin, which would be like the safest long-term bet that you could possibly make. So I can, I think it completely changes everything. I guess like the way that I've thought that it might potentially 
play out is like when you hold Bitcoin, you're effectively like disallocating resources away from the world. And you're just holding this like digital rock that like takes no resources from everything. And so like to, to think about it, like in, a, in another way is like if the entire world put all of their wealth in Bitcoin, now all of a sudden everything, people, factories, businesses are, are basically free. Like or they're close to, to zero price. And so now all of the people that hold the Bitcoin can effectively be like, okay, well, uh, if your you know, time is, is close to free or like you have no, like, or this factory is, is a, a very cheap price, maybe the valuation of a company is very, very low. Maybe at that point, it makes sense to buy into the company. Like I, I've used the example before of like, if I could buy Apple, the company for 0.1 Bitcoin, I would, I would buy that today. Like, I, I, you know, cause I know over the next year, Apple's probably going to spend me off thousands and thousands of Bitcoins and dividends. I'm just, I'm not saying Apple's worthless today. I'm just saying that like the valuation for Apple needs to come way, way, way down before I even consider investing in Apple. And so that's probably what's, what's eventually going to happen is just all of these uh, resources, companies outside in the outside world the valuations just come down very, very massively. And a lot of the wealth, like a typical typical portfolio probably is just a ton of Bitcoin and maybe like a, spe a few speculative bets that people are making because they, they think they may see like alpha in Apple or their own business that they want to start or building a, you know, a, some sort of house that they want to build or, or an apartment building that they think they have some sort of edge on. But I think a lot of the world's wealth will eventually just end up in Bitcoin in cold storage. I think so too. And I, I hope so too. Really, really cool. And how do you think then, uh, if we have that discussion now with, with Bitcoin and, and kind of have a Bitcoinized world, how will Bitcoin change our perspective on uh, being rich and, and being wealthy? I feel like there, there could be a lot of changes there. Yeah, it's, well, one, I would say like it will massively like lower your time preference where like, I think a lot of people think about wealth today and they think about, you know, a big house, a nice car, uh, you know, things like that, vacations, uh, you know, watches or, or whatever. Whereas Bitcoin is like, maybe you save enough Bitcoin to where you don't work again or you, or you do work, but you do meaningful work to you and you think very, very long, long term. Um, and it's also just like people like wealthy people won't just be able to perpetually like grow, like grow their wealth in a, like a nominal adjusted basis. For, for example, like in today's world, I, you could kind of argue, especially like in the U S we kind of have socialism for the rich where like, if you own a bunch of real estate or you own a bunch of uh, S and P 500 stocks or, or, or private equity companies or whatever, those, you know, those assets go up over time. They generate a yield and they go up over time. Um, and, and so like, if you hold hundred million dollars in the S&P 500, maybe you make $2 million a year in dividends or $1 million a year in dividends. And then the actual, uh, S&P 500 goes up, you know, $7 million a year, six, $5 million a year off of your hundred million that you have. And so like, you can kind of like literally live forever, kind of rent seeking, um, because whenever things go bad, the government steps in, bails out companies. The Fed, you know, lowers interest rates, does QE, keeps the market going up, up and up forever. And you get your dividend every year and you, you know, your assets keep going up in dollar terms. Bitcoin, on the other hand, if there is no way to like extract rent from the rest of the world and like there's no lender of last resort and, and governments aren't just going to perpetually print Bitcoins because they can't to prop up all of your assets, then the only way to like get value from society or like consume or, from your Bitcoins is to like sell your Bitcoins and, and, and spend it. So you can't just like live off. If, if we're talking like the dollar doesn't exist, you can't just like live off of your Bitcoins forever because eventually you just spend your Bitcoins to zero. Of course, if technology deflation is accelerating massively, then maybe like to some extent you can, because things are getting cheaper and cheaper every year and you have to spend less and less Bitcoins. But at the end of the day, your, your Bitcoin stack is going down over time because you are spending your Bitcoins. And so that's kind of how I think that that wealth might change in the future is like the wealthy, you know, may not actually stay wealthy forever and ever. Um, you actually might, if the dollar doesn't exist, which is very, very far away, if that ever even happens, um, then you actually would have to spend your Bitcoin.
Um, and, and that would kind of be a complete change of, of how the, the wealthy live today. This would then also restore a true free market and, and true capitalism and not that weird capitalism that we have right now where the capital itself isn't even free. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Uh, really, really cool. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, the, the data. I hope it comes as, as quick as possible. <laughs> Me too. Uh, really good. <laughs> Um, then one thing before we uh, come to the end of the podcast, I want to get into uh, in how we measure uh, the growth of Bitcoin. I know uh, Bitcoin price predictions of Bitcoin uh, price talks are always really, really uh, popular uh, because not because uh, like it's probably uh, uh, popular because people really want to know like where is my Bitcoin going? What is the potential of Bitcoin? And before we get into that and maybe your thoughts on that, how do we even measure the growth and the success of, of Bitcoin? Is US dollar price really the, the best one or do, do you see it something else? Or how do you see yourself? Like how do you... Uh, ex, uh, assess yourself what is a successful bitcoin what metrics are you looking at that's a really good question because i think like some bitcoiners or some people will be like oh price doesn't matter um blah 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 but i honestly like i th i think price does matter like i think if bitcoin was at one dollars per bitcoin then like a lot of us would not be here and we'd not be talking about it um and and of course like when we say the dollar price of bitcoin is Going, is likely going to continue going up in a very aggressive manner. That doesn't mean like that we're thinking that you should be thinking like, oh, it buys one Bitcoin buys $100,000 or $200,000 or a million dollars. It's really like it buys $100,000 worth of goods and services that I eventually might want, or at least I might want the optionality of having um, like, or like I might want the optionality of buying a house that's worth happens to be worth hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, whatever, whatever it is, you kind of want the optionality of that. And so I, I think because like the dollar is effectively the world unit of account, it is kind of a, a pretty good measurement. It's, it happens to be like why everyone is obsessed with, you know, the price of Bitcoin, whether that's healthy or not healthy is probably another conversation, I guess. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good way to measure Bitcoin's growth and the value of Bitcoin, because that's how the world currently today measures wealth. Eventually, I think the world will measure wealth in Bitcoin itself, and there won't be like this intermediary uh, currency that's in the middle. But for now, yeah, I think like the dollar is a, is a good way to to measure the price of Bitcoin. And Do you f uh, think that there is some value towards models like we had stock to flow model? Uh, I think you even made a, a video about that, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and now the, 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 the new one is the power lot that seems to be very uh, popular, at least uh, this year. Uh, and there are probably other ones like Jesse Myers. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of his work also where he just like, okay, what is the percentage of what Bitcoin will cover? Uh, and then going from today's value and then seeing what we, you can purchase from that in the future. Uh, what is your like, do, do you have a favorite of them or do they make, uh, sense in measuring the, the future growth? Yeah, it's a great question. It's fun to think about. Um, I think they're all, I think I like them all. Like I don't, I don't hate any of them per se. Um, I think they're all like to some extent useful to like, just help normal people visualize what's happening and what might happen in the future, whether that's the power law model, the stock to flow model or Jesse Myers model, which I also like, or even Sailor's new model, whereas like he had the, the Bitcoin 24 uh, Excel sheet that he put out and uh, you know, what he presented in Nashville where he kind of, it's kind of like a variation of the power law, but he projected like $13 million per Bitcoin or something like that. in in 2040 or, or 2044 or something, some one year like that. Um, I think they're all useful. Like kind of the, the simple and the best way that I like to think about it thinking from first principles is gold is a $20, $20 trillion asset. Bitcoin is currently about a $1 trillion asset, a little more now. At the very least, I think Bitcoin, you have a very easy case to make that Bitcoin is at least digital gold. Like it, 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 it's probably a lot better than digital gold, but at the very least, it should be the exact same valuation as gold. 
it's more scarce than gold. It's more divisible than gold. It's more portable than gold. Uh, it's arguably more fungible than gold. It's more verifiable than gold. Like evaluating, you know, different monies on their monetary properties. And then you clearly see that Bitcoin is better. Like the only thing that might be worse per se is like Bitcoin has only been around for 15 years and gold's been around for thousands of years, but that's not really a good argument. Like that's just like history and doesn't, it's like, it's like if uh, Google exists today and chat GPT comes out and everyone starts using chat GPT and chat GPT starts earning, taking all of the ad revenue, theoretical example, and no one's using Google anymore, then that doesn't mean that like, you should still hold all of your wealth in Google. Like you should probably move a lot of your wealth into chat GPT because they're going to make all of the money starting now. Um, obviously that's not a perfect example, but I think it's kind of the same thing with Bitcoin and gold is you have a better technology that exists for saving value into the future. And Bitcoin is, you know, that's, that's what Bitcoin is. And so Bitcoin is probably going to be worth at least the amount of gold. Uh, and, and, and maybe like the market is inefficient right now and it's taking time to correct to the price of gold, um, or a lot higher. But I think if you look through history, it's like, if you are an economist that believes in efficient markets and you think that, uh, prices do trend towards their most efficient price, then I think like that's kind of the best argument as to like why Bitcoin has done so well over the last 15 years, because the market is like correcting as aggressively and as fast as possible to the, the most efficient price that Bitcoin should be trading at. And obviously we have 8 billion humans that are all imperfect and trying to figure out how to allocate capital throughout the world. But the best argument for like Bitcoin and for like efficient markets is like, that's why Bitcoin has a compound annual growth rate of like a hundred and something percent over the last 15 years or whatever it is, because the market is literally trying to correct upwards towards the price of gold or towards 10 X the price of gold or whatever it really should be. Um, so I think the models are useful. I think there's even simpler ways to think about it. Like just, you know, the comparable from Bitcoin to gold. Um, but I think like at the end of the day, probably a model like Jesse Myers, where he's like, pointing out that Bitcoin should take X percentage from real estate, X percentage from gold, X percentage from equities. I think that's probably the, the best way to think about it, but it's also like the world is going to change so much over the next 20 years that it's going to be very hard to tell like what exactly, uh, you know, Bit what the per exact percentage that Bitcoin will be taking from each of those asset classes. So at the end of the day, it's just a guess. My guess is, is, uh, that I'm pretty confident in is that the real price of Bitcoin should be a lot, lot, lot higher than it is today. <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems to be a, a, a good guess. Yeah. It's, it's uh, the last point that you mentioned is really interesting also because um, uh, like, even if we like just assume like, okay, Bitcoin will take up like, I don't know, 50% uh, or 30% of the whole uh, market that is there right now. But then there is also the thing, okay, we will probably lose some Bitcoin. We already lost some Bitcoin, so you cannot measure it against 21. You probably have to measure it against 15 million. Maybe we'll lose another two, three, four, five million Bitcoin in, in the future. I don't know. Uh, and then there's this thing coming, okay, we, we will get more humans uh, maybe in, in the future. We'll, we'll have, if we want to survive, we have to have a positive birth rate. Uh, long run, otherwise humans uh, will distinct anyways. Uh, then uh, maybe they're coming other planets, but that's like really far, far in the future. And then one thing I think that's usually not mentioned is we are getting so much more productive and efficient in doing things. There are AI bots and like what, what does that has an impact on the Bitcoin price if uh, we have not only 10 billion people working in, on the planet, but also uh, 50 billion AI bots that do a lot of the things and maybe even like physical uh, uh, bots that do house cleaning and all the things that we kind of don't have to work a lot of the things and everything is automated. So um, that that's what makes even the uh, the thing like, oh, let's, let's just like look at what the full potential of Bitcoin is. Like, yeah, it's truly infinity. There, there's a yeah. limit to that, but... The, the 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 limit is moving up with time like it's like the carrot in front of the horse it's, it's like you, you never really reach the limit so uh, I, I like the meme where like bitcoin goes through to infinity even though it's not correct metaphorically because you always have a limit 
but the limit is kind of moving up with the humans getting more efficient uh if if that's a it's a good way to look at it i don't know uh, if you think yeah no absolutely i mean it's like explaining to uh someone 200 years ago that we could even have this conversation right now it's like how much would you pay or how much how much would it cost for someone 200 years ago to communicate with someone in the united states and someone in europe it's like that there's not even a price for that like that was impossible 200 years ago now it's like that same thing is going to play out with new products and services that we cannot even imagine and then it's like our very basic necessities like shelter food uh clothing like those are also probably going to become 10x cheaper 100x cheaper especially in bitcoin terms 1000x cheaper basically infinitely x cheaper if if technology continues progressing at the rate that it you know historically has then yeah bitcoin's probably going to like levels that people can't even comprehend just like 200 years ago people cannot even comprehend all of the wealth that we really have today I, I always bring up um, uh, my own podcast as 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 it's kind of obvious uh, as an example for exactly what you just said. Like, just go back twenty years ago and think of the same thing that we are right now doing uh, with a daily Bitcoin podcast, um, bringing out that with different guests all around the world, people from Africa, people from America, people from Australia. The same thing but 20 years ago that would be like i don't know 20 people <laughs> employed with with that and and uh, a lot of costs be with with uh, uh recording that and planes because you have to like actually move through the countries and get the people where where, where they should be because there's not such so a thing as video conference thing but also if you just look back three four years ago it would also be very hard to keep the pace up because I l use a lot of AI tools to do a lot of the the the, the heavy lifting. Um, even like five years ago, I, I probably could not do the same uh, pace of podcasts alone. Like I'm completely, it's just me. There's not any other person working on that. So it, it gives an idea of how fast we will be at getting efficient. And I, I love that you brought up that example. A lot. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's going to be crazy. Absolutely. Really cool. Um, Before we come to the end routine, I want to give you also the opportunity uh, to talk about Unchained. Uh, as I understand it, Unchained is offering uh, a collaborative uh, multi-signature solution. Is it like f uh, two out of three, three out of five? What are you offering? Yeah, it's a great question. So like, obviously we talked about Bitcoin a lot here and and we've it, and we 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 are explaining the importance of like number go up and and why it's very highly likely that the number is going to go up a lot and you're going to have a lot of potential wealth. But like the key to all of this is like you have to be able to securely hold your Bitcoin for the next few years or decades or even generations. And so a lot of people, you know, they'll buy a hardware wallet, they'll store it on an exchange, they'll hold it with an ETF. But I would argue that the best way to go about holding Bitcoin is with some form of collaborative custody where there's not a single point of failure when it comes to holding your Bitcoin, right? Like if you hold your Bitcoin on an exchange or an ETF or a, a single hardware wallet, that's those are all single points of failure. Like if the hardware wallet disappears or your seed phrase disappears, your Bitcoin's gone. If the end, uh, exchange, you forget your password and you can't contact support or the exchange gets hacked, your Bitcoin are gone. If the ETF, if your brokerage account locks you out, you, you're, you out, your government locks you out of your brokerage account or the ETF custodian loses the Bitcoin, your Bitcoin is gone. So on, Unchained, what, what we do is we enable multi-sig custody, collaborative multi-sig custody. This effectively just means that there's multiple keys that secure your Bitcoin. And so in the example that you brought up, you can have a personal vault where there's three keys that secure your Bitcoin and protect your Bitcoin. Two of those three keys are required to move the Bitcoin out of your vault. And in the example of a personal vault, you can hold two keys and then you Unchained holds the, the third key. And so in that scenario where you happen to lose one of your keys, one of your hardware wallets gets destroyed or one of your seed phrases gets destroyed or stolen, you don't actually lose all of your Bitcoin. You, ha you, you have no single point of failure because you only need two keys and you happen to have one remaining still if you happen to have lost one. And then Unchained has one as a backup. 
And so I would say like when it comes to securely holding your long-term savings for the very long term, you need to make sure that there's not a single point of failure for your Bitcoin. And and you can do that with with Unchained. Really cool. Yeah. It's it's definitely I think it's the the the, the sleekest way to to hold Bitcoin. Like there are a lot of I love and I always push that a lot on the, on the channel. Also, I always want to encourage people to do self custody. Uh, and obviously, as you mentioned, the first step is just to like have a, a harder wallet, and that's probably like a good way to, to start. Uh, and then you just like go go down the rabbit hole of like okay, like okay, I have a harder wallet, but then I need a, a backup, uh, so I bought a steel wallet and. Then you oh, but what if someone comes? Then no, oh, like multi signature. Oh, but then there's all the people. Then let's let's incorporate an, another uh, company with a collaborative custody with, with Unchained or something like that. So it's it's a it's a deep rabbit hole, and I encourage everyone to go down there because this is probably the most important thing. That's the second most important thing after I need Bitcoin. Uh, is like I need self custody. <laughs> that's yeah. that's, uh, that's probably the, the most important thing after getting getting the the monetary aspect of of Bitcoin is really, really cool. Perfect. Then yeah, thank you so much. Already um, we have two end routines. The first one is the same question for every guest. Um, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? It's a good question. Um, for me, beside Bitcoin, I would say like. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about my report, which was yes, about Bitcoin, but also about like technology and kind of exactly what you were talking about, like it highly advancing, uh, you know, how, how advanced humanity is, has, has been in the report. I have this section called the acceleration of production, where I go through like food, energy, lumber, and a few other sections, uh, telecommunications, stuff like that, and data storage. And it shows like over the last hundred plus years, like how much more productive we are at these things that are effectively producing basic consumer goods that we all need, like food, lumber, uh, shelter, uh, data storage, whatnot. And, you know, those things have gotten more expensive in dollar terms, but they are, but we're actually like able to produce a lot more of them just in terms of like how productive we are. For example, like in the year 1900, um, one U S farmer was able to feed four people on average. Today, one U.S. farmer can feed 150 plus people on average. And so that's just showing that like food's gotten a lot more expensive, but we're becoming a lot more productive at food. And I have a lot more other examples in that report that anyone's happy, you know, you're welcome to go check out. It's actually at unchained.com slash melting. But um, that's kind of like, I'm, I'm highly interested in like accelerating technology and, and seeing like what's going to happen over the next decade and kind of what has happened over the last century. I think that that's a, a great place to, to start. And I, I did a lot of research and, and thought about it a lot um, in that report. Uh, really, really cool. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that uh, everyone should uh, check that out. Other end routine is, uh, of the podcast is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And the question is an interesting one. I almost asked it <laughs> before when we talked about Bitcoin, but I kept it for the end routine because the previous guest asked it. What role do you think Lightning plays once we are at hyper Bitcoinization, one uh, the layer twos? Yeah, I mean, one, I would say it's it's going to be. I'm very bullish on Lightning, and I think it's potentially like the way that Bitcoin is passed around um, as a medium of exchange post hyper Bitcoinization. Um, and and I think one thing that might be interesting in regards to this is I think most Bitcoin will still sit in, in like cold storage and never really move. Um, and when I say most Bitcoin, I'm thinking like 90%, 99% and effectively like 1% of all Bitcoin might be on the lightning network or maybe even less than that. And then that's kind of the Bitcoin that's being passed around and used for commerce on a daily basis. And most Bitcoin will just sit there and, and, and not really move because it's utility is going to be long-term savings. Um, so yeah, I think like lightning has the potential to be the way that we move Bitcoins around and, and communicate value and buy things, sell things. And so I'm hyper bullish on lightning. Um, but you know, time will tell. Yeah, absolutely. Really cool. Uh, before I let you go, um, where can people find you personally? Where can they ask you questions? Yeah, you can find me personally on Twitter and YouTube. Uh, I'm, 
uh, Joe Burnett on Twitter. My handle is I, I, I capital. And then on YouTube, you can just type in Joe Burnett Bitcoin. And I should, I should pop up there. And then if you want to learn more about Unchained and how to securely hold Bitcoin for generations, you can go to unchained.com um, and, and check us out. Really cool. Thank you so much, Joe, for, for being on. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening uh, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.